first little item of business I would like to attend to is arguably one of the kings of thrash metal. I mean, arguably, let's all, let's definitely one of the kings of thrash metal. Dave Mustaine did an interview uh, with this guy, Jeremy White. And I've never heard of Jeremy White, but this is honestly one of the best interviews I've ever seen with Dave Mustaine. And uh, so what I'm going to do here is uh, just just share a couple of these little chunks of it with y'all. And uh, hold on a sec. Let me just make sure that this is uh, 100% kosher because I have a bad habit of sharing without sound. And you need to hear what this guy's saying. So this first clip is Dave talking about um, just the 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 current incarnation of Megadeth and their kind of um, discipline. Check it out. I always said that you know, getting loaded was like having sex with a gorilla. You know the rest of the saying, right? You're not done until the gorilla's done. Okay, I I lied. I had to start with that because that is brilliant. Getting loaded is like having sex with a gorilla. You're not done until the gorilla's done. <laughs> the wisdom of Dave Mustaine, ladies and gentlemen. Right. You know, and and um, it, it, yeah, it takes what it takes. I saw you guys in Laval a couple of weeks ago on the Crush the World Tour. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, one of the best shows. This is what I've I thought seen. was interesting. Just from a, a sonic standpoint, the band just is so good. So this is the uh, kind of the piece of the interview that I wanted to highlight because I thought Dave had some interesting information to share right here. Good. Your front of house mix was incredible. So just big props to your, your front of house guy. Hey, I, I was standing in front of house and he was doing adjustments through the entire show. He did not stop, you know, playing with the plugins and like adjusting and, and you could hear it in the mix. You could, you, you felt and heard the kick, but you, you heard the picking and you felt the bottom of the bass. Like everything was just fantastic. So, um, yeah, he, you got to keep that guy. He's a fantastic talent and, and I let him know it. Uh, was just talking to him about the Budokan show as well as the fact we record everything every night so that we can study them. It's much like football tapes on Monday morning. And we, we so that is the point that I wanted to talk about right there. I thought that was so interesting. They record their shows every night so that they can examine the nuance of, of it and get better with each show that's amazing and that's the kind of discipline that you would expect from a guy like dave mustaine who's a little bit of a perfectionist um but i just thought that was a really cool little factoid um given you know the status of dave let's listen a little bit more we really do that and, you know when the show's over we ask for the light director and uh, front of house uh, sound man you're talking about right now we ask them for tapes either either a videotape or an audio tape of some sort and it will either be the whole band or it may be an individual track of somebody there was one part that i was listening to on the bass and i thought damn it i i, I showed that to james wrong and uh so we went back in and we listened and he was playing it right and for some crazy reason, I was just hearing it wrong. So that was great to be able to listen to his track soloed up because <clears throat> we all want what's best for us. I especially want to make sure my playing's good because I kind of anchor things for everyone. Right. And it's nice to know that you. So I thought that was interesting. Sidebar, we won't take into Dave Ellison and why he's no longer in the band. Um, I have my own thoughts on that, which I, I won't share at this point in time, but Definitely cool to see that level of discipline um, from Dave Mustaine. So this next part, um, I thought this was interesting. Dave talks about his transition to a couple different guitar brands. I had no idea that he's now working with Gibson. Um, and if you're a guitar player like me, you kind of probably know about the dynamics between Gibson and Fender. I'm getting a little bit gray in the mustache here. 
Um, but let me explain that to people who might not. So Fender has always kind of had a little bit of a, a thinner sound because they use mainly a single coil pickup um, and strats have kind of a, like a more of a thin kind of raw sound. Whereas Gibson has kind of a bigger, thicker sound. Um, and it's because of the humbucker double coil pickups that, that they tip- typically have. And they use, you know, like a, a bridge and neck pickup that are double coil. And just to give you some examples, uh, Adam Jones from tool is, is the, kind of forefront of modern Gibson players, I would say, but, you know, someone like Jimmy Page um, really popularized that big sound and Jimmy plays Fender as well. And, and, and there's, there's pluses and minuses to both Jimmy Hendrix played Fender strats. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really a matter of preference and you can get big sound out of both guitars. Don't get me wrong, but you know, Les Paul, obviously a craftsman, and Fender as well. Um, Fender, I actually did a, a little bit of a contract work for Fender a few years ago, and I was very, very impressed with the specifically. I worked in the digital department, and most of them were, you know, corporate tools. I'm not gonna lie, but uh, the people who work in the gear department of Fender, the people who develop gear, are absolutely real musicians. I remember wearing a Mr. Bungle shirt to school or uh, uh, to school. I remember wearing a Faith No More shirt to work one day and just getting into this long conversation about the nuance of Mike Patton and Mr. Bungle and everything with one of the techs there. So props to Fender for at least hiring good techs. Um, So anyway, I'll shut up now and let's listen to what Dave has to say about this. It is. And it's supposed to be the last farewell tour. Uh, talking about guitars and, you know, they got to sound good before going into the amp. You got this brand new Kramer signature guitar coming out. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's super exciting. You've had the Gibsons, the Epiphones, but now you're branching off onto the sister company of Gibson. You've got a Kramer now. Uh, talk a little bit about that. It's a beautiful guitar. Thank you. Um, it's been all uh, pretty pretty magic for me. I, I uh, had... Um, for whatever reason, um, I left Jackson, went to ESP, wasn't happy there, went to Dean, was happy there until the person that had brought me there passed away because we had a common vision. I know he's not talking about Dimebag there, but I, I had to wonder if that's who he was subtly referring to because Dimebag was a big Dean player and Dean developed a lot of his guitars, but. And after he passed away, I realized that I probably should you know, get a new start somewhere with somebody who understands me because I don't want to, um, I don't want to ruin anything for Dean and I don't want to uh, certainly ruin anything for myself. So um, I was going to leave and I heard about Gibson. We went there and the deal of me uh, being an endorser for Gibson alone was was fantastic, but to be an ambassador for the company, which is a whole nother level, and to uh, represent not only Gibson, but Epiphone and Kramer, to have the, um, the... So just sidebar, a lot of people don't realize this, but much like in in every other industry, the guitar industry has greatly consolidated. So Gibson owns Epiphone and Kramer, and Fender owns brands like Jackson, um, Gretsch. Um, there's a bunch of different. I, you know, those are just the two I can think of off the hand. Anyway, point is, you know, a lot of the Fender and Gibson kind of run the game, and they own all the. They kind of bought up all the sub. A lot of the sub brands, as far as guitars go, the classic shape with the round legs on the bottom and then to have the modern shape with the pointed legs on the bottom. It's uh, the best of both worlds with these shapes and they've all three have my hand measurements for the neck. So it's exactly the same every guitar. So you pick up a Gibson and you play it and you're going, damn, this is a mighty guitar and then you pick up a kramer and and uh you're thinking it sounds exactly the same of course there is the history and 
Gibson is a, a higher value instrument to some people, thus the price point. Kramer is a uh, guitar. I mean, ESP, he played with ESP. That's what Metallica uses. Uh, ESPs, you know, those are three to $5,000 guitars at the, at the low, on the low end, so. That is about you know, $1,600, $1,700, uh, whereas the Gibsons are a little bit more. Epiphone's right in the middle there. And they, like I said, they all feel the same. So they're all using my guitar pickups too, the Dave Mustaine uh, thrash factors or the live wires, depending on how you want your guitar configured, if you want an active or a passive guitar pickup. And with Gibson, we started off with passives and it was, it was just a love affair from the very beginning. And then going through the other lines with Epiphone and Kramer, it, it wasn't really that difficult to make these lines all of a sudden have serious metal credibility. Because somebody said to me when I first went to Gibson and they said, Gibson is in a metal guitar company. I said, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Brilliant. That is really cool. That is really cool. So Dave doing some 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 full blown um ambassadorship, literally developing guitars for Gibson. And I love that line. It is now. That's the kind of Dave has always had that kind of um, people would call it arrogance. The difference to me between confidence and arrogance is confidence has, you know, some some real some reality behind it. Arrogance is unfounded confidence to me. It's like you're arrogant. You think you're bad and you're not where I mean, Dave Mustaine made rust in peace. So he is definitely bad. <laughs> 